Sermon on the Mount, Prophets False and True, Part 2. It's getting a bit colder. A little snow coming down, three degrees. I did that other message just a few minutes ago, but I'm feeling it. Uh, because we're continue our discussion on Matthew 7, 15 to 20, I think it's good if I read this again uh, and then uh, conclude with uh, the comments. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Last time, we asked how can we tell who a false prophet is? It's by looking at their lives. Not everyone who believes a wrong thing is a false prophet, otherwise we would all be false prophets. Not everyone who teaches a wrong thing is a false prophet. Uh, but there's a, there's a side to it that's moral. There's some, something that's decadent. There's decay in that person, trying to look good on the outside when the inside is a very different story. And uh, one of the observations at the end of the last talk is that even if what they say is true, they could still be misleading everybody. If you want a good example of that, look at the prophet Balaam in the Old Testament in Numbers 22 to 24. What he said seemed to be right. Uh, this is the prophet who was hired by the Moabites to curse the Israelites. He seemed like he was a good guy. You know, he, he didn't want to go against God. And even, there's even a messianic prophecy in his words. And yet, as we learn a few chapters later in Numbers, and as we learn in Second Peter, not a good guy at all. So uh, let's, we shouldn't be too quick to judge either way. Not too quick to judge someone as evil, who actually may be a wonderful person. Not too quick to judge someone as good just on appearances or on short-term results or on popularity, number of likes, whatever you say. I'd like to share now an extended quotation from someone I've met. I really like this guy. I've heard him. He's uh, big in the civil rights movement in the United States. He's a uh, very powerful uh, man. And his name is Jerry Taylor. Uh, and this is uh, what I'm going to read to you is from Levin, a journal of Christian ministry. Uh, and this was published in 2008. But I'm going to read uh, these words. I just found them very powerful. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. False prophets have a peaceful exterior, but their inner nature is a swirling chaos of violence, moving about like a tornado, looking for a place to touch down. They are grievous wolves that spare not the flock. They are greedy for power, gain, and self-promotion by any means necessary. False prophets seek to convince the disciples of Jesus that the Sermon on the Mount is impractical in the real world. However, false prophets do see some value in the words of Jesus. They see his words as a valuable commodity to be sold for profit in the marketplace of religious consumerism. Jesus knew that false prophets would always be in popular demand. False prophets have a market that will never suffer a slowdown or recession because religious consumers tirelessly shop for doctrines of easyism. They go from church to church, like going from yard sale to yard sale, eagerly looking for smooth words that are for sale. Religious consumers are shopping for words with smooth edges that will calmly caress their feelings of guilt that arise when they intentionally choose not to put into practice the words of Jesus. They bargain hunt for words that give them permission to seek the destruction of not only their actual persecutors, but also the destruction of anyone who could potentially propose a threat of persecuting them in the future. They want modern prophets who will tell them that they don't have to endure persecution like the prophets of old, that they will never have to suffer insult 
by others who spread false propaganda about them, saying all kinds of evil against them for Jesus' sake. I really like the way Jerry fleshes out the deceptive side of the false prophet and even uh, exposes possibilities uh, uh, surrounding their motives. And there's one phrase that I especially, uh, it hits me here, a peaceful exterior, but inner nature is a swirling chaos of violence, <laughs> moving like a tornado. <laughs> Uh, a swirling chaos of violence. Well, sometimes I feel inside I'm chaotic, um, but the, the image of the tornado, you know, in the United States, that's a serious image. 80% of all tornadoes in the world, I believe, happen in the U.S. and Canada. So that is great. I mentioned yesterday that biblically, um, not uh, the, the true prophets don't outnumber the false prophets. It's the other way around. Other way around. Uh, I'll give you a couple of quick examples uh, from 1 Kings. Elijah on Mount Carmel, where we stood just a few weeks ago. There are 850 false prophets, one true prophet. Earlier in that chapter, there's another true prophet and another 100 following him. So you could say 102 against 850. At the end of 1 Kings, Micaiah, son of Imla, stands alone against 400 false prophets. Now that's, I'm not saying that's a magic ratio, but keep that in mind. You can probably name many of the true prophets. The Bible names many of the false prophets, but there's so many of them that most of them are not named at all. It's time to wrap up our reflection here on the narrow road, the broad road, on prophets true and false uh, as we move towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We still have a little bit to go. But first, look at the fruit, the character, their behavior, their impact. If we want to avoid being deceived, look at character, not just character, look at behavior, look at impact. Authentic disciples and leaders will display increasingly consistent behaviors that are consonant with their Lord's life and instructions. Uh, Mary Ellen Pereira said that. I think she put it really well. So authentic disciples and leaders, we could say authentic prophets, will display increasingly consistent behaviors that are consonant, that is, they're consistent with the Lord's life and instruction. So becoming more like the Lord all the time. Rejecting God's standard of holiness, which we see in Matthew 7, 13 to 14, but actually we see it in the whole Sermon on the Mount. These teachers, the ones we see in 7.15 to 20, will cause many to be unprepared and even in shock come Judgment Day. We'll be looking at that very soon. So how's our conviction? How's your conviction and mine? <laughs> now a little ice is mixed in with the snow. They call this a wintry mix. It's, it sounds like a <laughs> mix of what? Yep. How's our conviction? Remembering the love and sacrifice of our Lord and responding in gratitude will fortify us against falsehood. The, the solution is not just, let me learn the scriptures more or let me read some books about prophecy or books on how to identify false teachers. Um, yes, someone needs to do that. Someone needs to take a look at what's being taught and make those assessments. And uh, I, I certainly, you know, if you know me, you know I'm not against education. But to protect ourselves, we need to look at their character. Is it spiritual? Their behavior, do they do what they say? They practice what they preach? And their impact, how is this affecting other people? And again, remembering the love and sacrifice of our Lord, because he's, I mean, we compare, all of us are, are judged against the standard of his character. We're remembering his love and responding in gratitude, as long as we stay connected, and we're, then we'll fortify ourselves against falsehood. Well, 
Our next talk, Sermon on the Mount X, is called simply Lord, Lord. I hope you'll continue and finish off the series. And goodbye for now from sleeting, raining, hailing, windy, cold Edinburgh. Have a great day.